And let's dive right in. I am recording this, so if you have, I mean, I could, I guess, pause the recording, but I hope that if you have any questions, you will find them being picked up by the mic. Um, we are in Edwards Differential Equations, and we are looking at section 1.1, a largely introductory section that still presents important definitions and concepts. So what is a differential equation, first of all? A differential equation is, it's hard to say this without sound it sounding circular, it's an equation relating a function to its derivative. And the solution to a differential equation is a function. So this is different from the equations we're used to looking at where solutions are numbers. So, um, for example, something like dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x equals k, times y. Um, here I'm trying to emphasize that y is a function. And this is maybe slightly new, but it's, I mean, if you think of something like you've seen, you know, things that look like this plenty of times. So there's no reason you shouldn't think of this using function notation. So in this class, we're going to be thinking of y as a function instead of a variable. And ordinarily, we would not write this this way, but I'm trying to emphasize that fact. I'm trying to emphasize that y is a function here. And a solution to this differential equation, remember that solutions to differential equations are functions. A solution here is y of x equals e to the power of k times x. Never mind for now where this solution comes from. We'll talk about how I solved it later. For now, what I mean when I say this is a solution is that dy dx equals k times e to the kx. e to the kx is y. So dy dx does indeed equal k times y of x. So that's an example of a differential equation and a solution to a differential equation. We'll see, as you would expect, a 
bunch of differential equations in this class. Um, before I go any further, just sort of an administrative note. In differential equations, we very, even though we're working with functions, we very rarely use function notation. The more normal way of writing that equation that I wrote on the previous frame would be a dy dx equals ky. And you have to understand here that we're treating y as a function of x, even though we're not using function notation. And I mean, a lot of textbooks and we'll go further and just write something like y prime equals ky. They won't even explicitly tell you what the variable is. They're just sort of supposed to intuit that y is a function of x here. And that can actually be slightly um, confusing or slightly counterintuitive because in differential equations, sometimes we treat y as a function of x, but it's also very common to treat x as a function of t. So we can see dy dx equals ky, We could also see dx dt equals kx. So we'll stick with this convention, where if we're working with y, our variable is x, or if we're working with x, our variable is t. And this is just the sort of life in differential equations. There are a few notational conventions that I would have done differently, but it all happened centuries ago and no one asked me. So more examples of differential equations, something like, dx dt equals k times x times x minus m, where k and m are constants. And again, the key thing to notice here, or a key thing to notice here, is that x is being treated as a function. I mean, because we're taking the derivative of x with respect to t. So here you see x and you don't see function notation. You don't see x of t, but x must be a function. Um, then you could have differential equations with partial derivatives, but if you haven't taken calculus three yet, or you have taken it, but you didn't like it, there's uh, no need to worry. We're not actually going to look at differential equations that look like that in this class. I'll just observe that we can have them. So our goal, if we are doing research involving differential equations, we have kind of two general goals. The first goal is given a real world situation, discover a 
differential equation that represents it. And we're not going to be doing this a lot in this class, um, but we are going to look at a fair number of applied problems, like a fair number of situations where differential equations are being used to study real world situations. Everything from um, the velocity of a moving object to changing animal populations where you have a predator and a prey species and their interaction together. So we're going to look at a lot of real world situations from a wide array of disciplines. And for us, you know, somebody else will already have done this step. Like the models we'll be looking at are all very famous models that someone else has already come up with for us. The second goal is to, well, to try to understand the solution. Let me say, to solve differential equations and slash or gain insight into the solutions. Our textbook which I like in most ways, but it blunders here. Our textbook says that the goal of a differential equations class is to solve differential equations. And I mean, the author must know that that's not true because a lot of real world differential equations can't be solved, or at least they can't be solved by hand. Sometimes you could use numerical software to approximate the solution. But like that population model I mentioned, where you've got predator and prey animals, we're never going to solve the differential equation that represents that model, that situation. What we're going to do, though, is even without solving it, we're going to be able to gain insight into how the model works. I mean, in that particular case, without ever solving the model, we'll be able to figure out that as time passes, we see these closed loops where prey and predator both go up then predator population goes up as prey goes down, then the predators start to starve and predator and prey populations both go down. Then the predators are no longer eating the prey because there aren't a lot of them. So the prey population goes back up. I mean, we'll be able to generate this graph and get that understanding without ever actually solving the differential equation. And I mean, in a lot of real world situations, this is what we're at. We try to understand the equation, try to understand the solution, even though we can't actually find the solution. So, Saying that our goal is just to solve these equations is not quite true. But let's talk a little more about solutions. 
And then having said that we're usually not going to be able to find solutions in most real world differential equations, we'd still like to know, you know, what they are when I talk about the solution, what do I mean? So, a solution to a differential equation is a function that satisfies it on some interval. So, I mean, I hope a pretty straightforward definition. I mean, what's the solution to a quadratic? Well, it's a number that satisfies the quadratic equation. So what's the solution to a differential equation? What's a function that satisfies the differential equation? We, here, I guess I sort of took it as a, Granted that this would be straightforward. Here's a differential equation. Here's its solution. We know that e to the kx is a solution to this because it satisfies it. dy dx equals k times e to the kx equals k times y. And that's exactly what dy dx was supposed to be. The differential equation was dy dx equals k times y, and this solution works. So like, again, not to worrying about where these solutions come from. But dy dx equals two times x times y has as a solution y equals was a constant c times e to the power of x squared. And again, to verify that this is a solution, we'll take its derivative and see whether it works. The derivative of this uh, we need, for a, for a class about derivatives, we actually need surprisingly little calculus, but I hope at least your chain rule is, you know, fine. The derivative of this is c times 2x. times e to the x squared. So that's 2x times c times e to the x squared, just moving stuff around. Well, c e to the x squared is y. So dy dx equals two times x times y, precisely what dy dx was supposed to be. So this is a solution to this differential equation. 
Going back here, do you see the phrase on some interval? There's not really an interval here. This is true for any value of x. Um, what is meant when we talk about satisfying it on some interval is in a case like this, where let's spice things up by using x and t, just because that's something we should get used to as soon as possible. dx dt equals x squared has as a solution x equals c, divided by one minus C T. And again, we're at this point not interested in where that solution comes from, but it is a solution. And uh, demonstrating that it's a solution is, I guess, a slightly tedious, but it's just calc to this. You, uh, Need the, need the quotient rule, which is maybe one of those things that people learn and then forget. But let's see. The derivative of the top times the bottom minus the top times the derivative of the bottom. So when the dust clears, we do wind up with dx dt equals x squared. So this is a solution. Now, having said that, we look at our variable, our independent variable. If we look at t, there's a value where we do not have an x. x is not defined everywhere here. In particular, um, at p equals one divided by c, x is not defined because of a division by zero error. So this solution is not a solution everywhere, but it doesn't need to be a solution everywhere to be called a solution. It just needs to be a solution on some interval. So this is a solution on that interval. So it is a solution. Now, I keep saying a solution. Um, C over one minus CT is really infinitely many solutions. You know, if C were two, that would give you a solution. If C were three, that would give you a different solution and so on. So really here, this is an infinite mass of solutions. Every value of C gives you a different solution. So x equals one over one minus t is a solution. 
x equals two over one minus two t is a solution and so on. And of course, there's nothing, um, you know, nothing that ha says that C has to be a nice integer, one half over one minus one half is a solution and so on. So this is true here and it's true that in general, differential equations will have infinitely many solutions. So solutions become unique when you are given, let's say, data. This is a slightly fuzzy statement, but let's take dy dx equals zero point five times y. We've already made the observation. We've looked at this example. When we looked at it, we had a K instead of a specific number. But Y equals E to the 0 0.5 times X is a solution for this. It's not the only solution. Just like in that last problem where we had a C, we can have a C in front of that E to the 0.5x, and it will still be a solution. Y prime equals C times 0 0.5 times E to the 0 0.5. 5x is 0 0.5 times y. Do you, I guess, with uh, given the size of the root, give me a second. Come on, Zoom. So we have an infinite number of solutions, and I claim that solutions become unique when you're given data. And that word data is kind of ambiguous. What we're usually given is something like this. The statement that y of zero equals for example, the statement that when x equals zero, y equals two. A statement like this is enough to allow you to solve for c, and it turns this infinite class of solutions into a single solution. We'll plug in 
that y equals 2 when x equals 0. We get that 2 equals c times e to the 0 power. e to the 0 power is 1. Anything to the 0 power is 1. So we find that C has to equal 2. And now instead of having an infinite number of solutions, we have a single solution. And this is true in general. Um, a differential equation has an infinite number of solutions, but when you're given data points that it has to go through, that infinite number of solutions collapses down into a single solution. And the kind of fancy way of talking about this is to talk about an initial value problem. The even fancier way of talking about it would be boundary value problem. And an initial value problem or a boundary value problem is just a differential equation plus some data to make your solution unique. And the reason it's called an initial value problem is that 99 times out of 100, the data you're given looks like this. When x is 0, y is something. Or if your variables are Instead of y and x, if your variables are x and t, when t is 0, x is something. So uh, usually, not always, but usually, our variable in differential equations is going to be time, and time being zero, therefore represents a start of something. It represents an initial state, which is where initial value problem comes from. Any questions so far? So I'm not going to dwell on existence and uniqueness. I'm just going to say that in this class, we are going to look at differential equations that have solutions. I mean, like in college algebra, for example, it's, it's easy to come up with equations that don't have solutions. This doesn't have a solution if you're working only with real numbers. So it's probably not surprising that you can write down differential equations without solutions. I mean, dx, dt, squared plus one equals zero. 
if you are working entirely in the real numbers, this isn't going to have a solution. And that's just because anything squared is positive, plus one has to be greater than zero. I mean, this doesn't have a solution for the same reason that this doesn't have a solution. So it's certainly possible to write down differential equations without solutions. And there's an entire sort of interesting, well, maybe opinions differ about whether it's interesting, but there's an entire branch of differential equations that looks at, you know, when does a differential equation have a solution? What condition, I mean, what conditions can we put on it that will make sure it has a solution? We're not really going to do that in this class. We'll look at one very famous theory, probably on Thursday. Other than that, we're simply going to assume that the differential equations we're looking at have solutions. And combining this statement with what we were looking at earlier, in general, they're going to have infinitely many solutions. But if you might have data, an initial value problem that takes those infinite solutions and collapses it down to a single solution. So a few further definitions. I put a differential equation on the board that had a partial derivative. Sorry, yeah, that had a partial derivative. And then I said, well, we're not actually going to look at differential equations like that. A differential equation is called ordinary if there are no partial derivatives and partial if there is at least one partial derivative. Partial derivatives are much harder to work with than ordinary derivatives. You'd really need to enter a graduate program and take master's level classes if you want to study those. We are going to do what every differential undergraduate differential equations class does and just look at ordinary differential equations. This, by the way, gives us one of these abbreviations that shows up so often that you should probably know what it means, ODE for Ordinary Differential Equations. So this is, you can think of this as a way of classifying a differential equation. Every differential equation is either ordinary or partial. Another way we classify differential equations is by order. And the order of the differential equation is the highest order derivative that 
appears in the differential equation. Um, we can have differential equations where we don't just have the derivative. We can have the second derivative. We can have the third derivative. The second derivative of y plus two times the first derivative of y minus y equals seven. There's a differential equation where we've got the second derivative and we've got the first derivative. And this is a second order differential equation because of that second derivative. It's actually, it's going to turn out that um, second order differential equations that look like this are very special and have a lot of important applications. But we could also, you know, we could have the third derivative of y plus x times the natural log of y equals the second derivative of y. And this is a third order differential equation because of that third derivative. The general uh, General guideline, which probably won't surprise you, is that low order differential equations are easier to work with than higher order differential equations. One last bit of classification. A differential equation might or might not be a linear. And again, just because we should get used to it, let's write this definition using x as our function and t as our variable. In fact, I'm probably going to do that for most of the rest of the semester. So this is as good a time to start as any. A linear differential equation is a function of the variable t times the nth derivative of the function x plus another function of the variable t times the n minus first derivative of the function x. And this pattern repeats, thus a function of t times the n minus second derivative of the variable x until finally we reach a function of t times x, no derivative, equals g of t. So if a differential equation happens to look like this, it is called linear. So one over t times the second derivative of x plus the sine of t times the first derivative of x minus the constant function of four times x, no derivative, equals e raised to the power of t. 
This is a linear differential equation. Compare and contrast to one over x times the second derivative of x plus the rest of this stuff. This is not linear, and the reason it's not linear is that these expressions in front of the derivatives are only supposed to involve your variable t. Here, the expression in front of the derivative involves the function x. So that second thing is not linear. Um, the obvious way to think about it, or maybe obvious should go in scare quotes there, but a linear differential equation looks something like a polynomial. Instead of powers, we've got derivatives. And instead of coefficients, we've got functions. Linear differential equations occupy a kind of interesting place in the field of differential equations. On their own, they're almost totally worthless. Almost no real world differential equation is linear. But what we're going to see is that linear differential equations can be used as a tool to study nonlinear differential equations. So we're not interested in them so much for their own sake as for what they can give us about other types of problems. We'll talk about that in due time. So differential equations can be partial or ordinary. They can be linear or nonlinear, and they can have any order. They're, I mean, any positive natural number for an order. That's it for our definitions, more or less should talk briefly about models. Um, I've said that in this class, we're going to look at a lot of word problems, essentially. I mean, a lot of problems where we've got some applied situation. We're looking at the velocity of a moving object. We're looking at the size of animal populations. We're looking at the number of people who are sick during an epidemic. We're looking at casualties during a battle. All of those things are things we'll study in this class. And all of them are examples of models. And a model, just a fancy way of talking about the differential equation that represents a real world situation. So differential equations and models are used in basically any field of science you can imagine. Um, in the very hard sciences, like physics, our models tend to be extremely accurate. 
accurate. The, I don't mean this as an insult when I say the word. The mushier the field, the more our models tend to only be giving us approximations of what's going on. So like Newton's law of cooling. The derivative of a temperature with respect to time is a constant times the temperature minus the ambient temperature in the room. Newton's law of cooling is extremely precise, but it's still not perfect. I mean, some, you know, if you have water, you know, in a bowl. The way it cools will depend on things like the shape of the bowl, the material the bowl is made out of, things like that. Newton's law of cooling assumes that there's a perfect ambient temperature that never changes. That's almost certainly not true. Um, your room probably changes its temperature slightly during the day as the sun goes up and goes down and so on. So Newton's law of cooling being a differential equation of physics is quite reliable, but it's still not perfect. I mean, it's still making assumptions. For example, it's making the assumption that there's a perfect ambient temperature that never changes. So every model, every differential equation that is, you know, representing a real world situation has to make some kind of assumption. And those assumptions are never going to be perfectly correct. And there's always going to be a balancing act in real world sort of science and stuff. There's always going to be a balancing act where on the one hand, you want your model to be as good as possible. But on the other hand, the better your model is, the more complicated it is, and the harder it is to do anything with. We see that in science, even something like physics, we could look at a differential equation where there isn't a fixed ambient temperature. We could look at a differential equation where the, the temperature looks like that. It's low in the morning and the evening and higher during the noon. And that would make Newton's law of cooling more accurate, but it would also make the differential equation harder to solve because instead of some nice ambient temperature, suddenly we've got some messy function. Um, this is even truer in fields like biology and business. So let's look at two differential equations. Both of which represent population changing over time. dp dt equals k times p is a differential equation that you can use to study populations. So this is an example of a model. Now all model, all models make modeling assumptions. A key assumption here 
is that this animal population has a constant birth rate and a constant death rate, that the birth rates and death rates never change. And this assumption is clearly false. I mean, birth rates and death rates are not perfectly constant. So going into this model, we know it's making assumptions that aren't true. And the question isn't so much, is this model perfectly accurate? The question is, is this model accurate enough for our purposes? Um, this model is a simple model, but it's not a bad model. This model works very well when an invasive species is brought into a new environment. In that situation, the birth rates and death rates tend to be pretty constant. The birth rates as high as it can be because there are no, uh, because there are abundance of resources and the death rates as low as it can be because there are no natural predators. So for that specific situation, this population model might be perfectly fine. In time, however, this population model is going to become less accurate. Um, in particular, as this invasive species grows and grows, eventually it's going to grow as large as it can. There's going to, oh, the, the lake can only sustain so many fish. So the birth rate is going to have to drop if, you know, if the fish population can't expand anymore due to limited resources, that has to be reflected in the birth rates decreasing. Here's an alternative population model. This population model makes a different assumption. Instead of assuming that the birth rates are constant, this model assumes that the birth rate decreases as the population increases. So both of these models are supposed to be studying a population, but different assumptions are giving us different models. The second model is probably more accurate than the first, but the downside is that it's also more complicated. The second model is also still not perfectly accurate. We can go into the math later when we'll actually study this model. But an assumption this model is making is that the birth rate decreases linearly. And that's an assumption that's almost certainly not true. Why would the birth rate decrease linearly? Why would it decrease in a straight line rather than in any other way? And the answer is, well, 
because if it decreases linearly, we get a kind of nice model we can study, whereas if it decreases in a more complicated way, we get a messier model that's harder to study, and it's not clear that the additional accuracy we're getting is making up for the additional difficulty. So all modeling, all the models we look at in this class, we're going to want to look at them with this in mind, that none of these models can be perfectly accurate. They all have assumptions built into them. And we'll look at what the assumptions are and why the modelers made those assumptions and also why the assumptions might be good or might be incorrect, depending on the situation. Okay, so looking ahead a bit, I've said that um, we normally can't solve differential equations. That is a true statement. Um, the next chapter of the textbook, and only the next chapter of the textbook, we'll look at kind of in fact, and we'll only look at maybe one or two, but we'll look at a few kind of techniques for solving simple differential equations. After that, it's all going to be, well, how can we understand differential equations without actually solving them? But on Thursday, we'll look at solving differential equations using integration. And I will see you then. Sounds good.